people, you should know that um, earlier this morning I got here and, and, and Ricky and Anton were practicing that song and Anton was playing it on the piano. He suddenly stopped and said, I don't like this, and he switched to the guitar. This was right before we started the service, and I said, that's like, kind of like me deciding suddenly I'm going to preach in Spanish today. I don't know how you do that, but thank you guys for that beautiful song. Well, a couple of years ago, our four boys, who are now all in their 20s, uh, happened to be home at the same time on one weekend. It doesn't happen that much anymore, but they were all home, spring break, summer, something like that. And one of the things they like to do when they're home all together is play basketball in the driveway. There they are. One of the things I love to do is to sit on the porch and watch them play basketball in the driveway. So this one day was kind of warm. It was in the spring, and I was watching, and all that watching kind of wore me out, and I got thirsty. <clears throat> so I went into the garage to get something cold to drink, and in my garage fridge, I found a can of cold root beer, which is odd because we don't usually have root beer, and I don't usually drink root beer, but there was a root beer. So I took the can of root beer, out, sat on the porch, and kept watching basketball. Well, then I finished the root beer. I needed to go throw it in the recycle bin inside, so I walked into our kitchen. Now, I don't know about your kitchen, but in our kitchen, the regular garbage and the recycle bin are on the same, like, pull-out cabinet. Do you have a situation like that? So I needed to drop my can into the recycle bin, the one in the back, but I happened to notice right as I went to do it that that bin had no plastic liner in it, no bag in it. Somebody had evidently taken it out to the garage but didn't replace the bag. And so I had a decision to make. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I could either assume that that someone had already checked to see if we had any more of those bags to go in there, uh, and we didn't have any more, that's why there wasn't a bag in there, or I could walk the two steps over to the kitchen sink, check the cabinet, and see if there were bags myself. And I decided. I just dropped my can into the regular garbage and went back out to watch basketball. And then a few minutes later, my wife came out because she also likes to watch, play ba- watch them play basketball. And when there was a stoppage in play, she said, hey, uh, hey, guys, by the way, who forgot to put the liner in the, in the recycle bin? And one of the boys immediately said, oh, I think that was me. I took it out. I forgot to put the bag in. She said, that's fine. Thanks for taking it out. But next time, put the bag in. And then she held up a root beer can and said, and who <laughs> dropped the root beer can into the regular garbage? And when she said that, all four boys just burst out laughing because they knew exactly who did that. Because they'd seen me with the root beer can, and they knew what I did. I'd sort of left that little chore for someone else to do. Now, we're in a summer series called The Disciplines of Grace. And we've been encouraging you and ourselves to build spiritual habits into our lives. And we began with the spiritual grace, the discipline of gratitude. Thinking of things every day and prayerfully that we are deeply grateful for. Then we moved on to noticing or attentiveness to God's presence and activity in our lives. Then last week we challenged you to uh, find ways to be secretly generous. And I hope you had fun doing that. I also hope you've noticed that you don't have to stop doing one to do the next one, that they're intended to build on each other as we develop these rhythms, the rhythms of grace in our lives. And today we're going to talk about the discipline or the grace of service or servanthood. We're going to look at Philippians in the New Testament. Now, most of you know that this was actually an ancient letter written by the Apostle Paul to a, a, a young church in a city called Philippi. Now, if you take a look at the map, Philippi is way there to the north. It's what we would call Greece. Then it was called Macedonia. And the church there began when the Apostle Paul felt called by the Holy Spirit to leave the region we would call Turkey and to cross the water and to go to that region. When he went there, he found some people praying down by a river. There was not even a synagogue in the city. Uh, And you can read about this in Acts chapter 16. And one of the people there was a woman named Lydia. Lydia became a follower of Jesus and her entire household, her family, and they were all baptized. And the church in Philippi was born. Now, in case you ever get asked the question on Jeopardy, uh, where, what, what was the first church in Europe? The answer is Philippi. That was the first church in that side of the body of water from Asia to Europe. Now, Paul is writing this letter from prison, uh, most likely from Rome, although there's some debate about that. And he's writing to encourage this young church. And the Philippian church was a good church. They were loving and generous and growing. But there's an issue Paul needs to take on in this letter. Only one negative issue. He refers to it in the fourth chapter. Let me read these couple verses to you. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche. Those are two female names. To be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, some people think that's Luke, who might have been an elder in that church, 
Uh, Help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, what was the issue between these two women? We don't really know. This is is the only place where they show up. But we can sort of guess that maybe it was a personality conflict. Maybe it was sort of a leadership conflict between two strong women. We don't really know. But it was an issue that needed to be dealt with. So the Apostle Paul writes this letter. And we're going to read now from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, one of the most beloved portions of the entire New Testament. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, I'm going to stop there because when you see that word, you should wonder what it's there for. Um, Back in chapter 1, Paul referred to his own suffering and how he was dealing with that. And he's encouraging the Philippian believers for whenever they face their obstacles and difficulties, how they can handle them. And in chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. In other words, what does the life of Jesus look like in the world? Therefore, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, notice all those things come with the gospel, with relationship with Jesus. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this is a profoundly theological text, one of the most important Christological texts in the entire New Testament, but it's also profoundly practical. Because Paul here is encouraging these young Philippian believers, and I believe also us, to imitate, first of all, the humility of Christ. That's the first point this morning, the humility of Christ. I came across this little story uh, a number of years ago. It's appropriate for today, but a mother is making breakfast for her two young sons, and she's making them pancakes. And as soon as the boys sit down at the table, uh, they start arguing about who's going to get the first pancake and being boys, you know. And so the mother, being a good mom, sees this as an opportunity for a little teaching moment, a little spiritual teaching moment. So she says, boys, 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 if Jesus was here, would he be arguing about getting the first pancake? And they knew the right answer. They shook their heads. She said, that's right. If Jesus was here, he would let his brother take the first pancake. It was quiet at the table. After a few moments, the older brother said to the younger brother, okay, you get to be Jesus today. He said... (laughs) I like that little story. But what is humility? The word Paul uses for humility here is a really long compound Greek word. You can't begin to pronounce it. But it's two words jammed together. One word that means low or lowly. The other word means mind or thinking. So literally, low thinking, it means to have a modest opinion of oneself. Now, we should know here that in the ancient Roman world, humility was not a desired character trait. It's interesting. Honor was what you were shooting for in life. Honor, personal honor, was the goal of life. You wanted to achieve it for yourself. Humility was associated with failure and shame. And here Paul changes all of that. First he teaches us what humility is not. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now maybe here he's thinking about those two women. Maybe he's thinking about this this butting of heads between them. Maybe he's thinking about himself. Because before he was Paul the Apostle, he was Saul of Tarsus, one of the most selfishly ambitious, vain, and conceited people in the whole world. He says, humility is not selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, the phrase selfish ambition is pretty self-explanatory. It means acting in self-interest, acting for selfish motives. Selfish ambition is wanting the first pancake for yourself just because you're you. 
But the word for vain conceit is a little more interesting. It means literally vain glory, wanting glory for yourself. And I want you to see how contemporary this 2,000-year-old letter really is because I believe that today we live in a culture of selfish ambition and vain glory. We live in what I would call a red carpet culture because we worship celebrity in all its forms. Isn't that true? Like, think about when you watch a TV show like the Oscars. Our buddy Ryan. Or maybe the Country Music Awards. Is it just me or or are the Country Music Awards on like every two weeks, (laughs) year-round? Or maybe even the NBA Awards show, which one of my sons and I watched last week. What do you see in common in those photos? Red carpet, right? Well, first, people are way more famous than we're ever going to be, celebrities, and way more wealthy than we're ever going to be. And then you see the red carpet. We live in a red carpet culture. And sometimes I think this bleeds over into how we just live life, like social media, for example. I don't want to step in any toes, because I've done this too. But sometimes when I look at Facebook or Instagram, what I see is a whole lot of, um, look at me. Look what I get to do. Look where I'm going. Look what I'm eating. Look at what my kids are doing. Now, we don't mean it that way because we just live in this culture. We live in a culture of selfish ambition and vain glory. We live in a a world that emphasizes know your rights, get what's coming to you, know what you deserve. We live in an upwardly mobile culture. It's what we're taught. Paul says humility is not like that. And then he teaches us what it is. He says in humility, value others above yourself. Now, it's important to say here that humility doesn't mean, you know, devaluing yourself as a human being. It's not saying, you know, I'm a nobody, I'm no good at anything, don't look at... No. It's simply valuing others above yourself. Humility is saying, you know, I'm hungry this morning, I'm going to have a pancake or two, but you can have the first one. See, it's a different thing. Or maybe after breakfast, you're on your way to work, and you're driving, and traffic's bad, it's hot, you're running late... And, there's, and, there's a, and then you're stuck in tra- and there's this guy going up the shoulder, you know, to, to get a, a jump on the, you know, there's always that guy, right? What's your initial reaction? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let that guy in. Don't let him in. He's costing me like five seconds of my trip. See, we all have this instinct of self-interest, don't we? Interestingly, I saw a little article online uh, by Forbes magazine. I don't usually read Forbes magazine. You can probably tell. But I saw this little article. It was entitled... Effective leaders choose humility over hubris. Hubris is the fancy word for pride. And this is what the article said. Leaders tainted by hubris live life, give life to toxic environments, workplaces where incivility and downright hostility often flourish. But leaders who choose humility and who model humbleness in their actions create the opposite kind of environment and outcomes that are mutually beneficial for the firm and for the individual. I read that and I thought to myself, Hmm, I wonder if that author has ever read from Philippians. The Apostle Paul was writing about this stuff 2,000 years ago. Humility is not looking after your own interests, not desiring your own glory or honor, but looking to the interests of others. And it sounds so simple. It sounds easy, doesn't it? But it's profoundly countercultural and it's profoundly unnatural because it demands that we also imitate what I'm calling today the emptying of Christ. That's the second point, the emptying of Christ. Let me try to explain. Long, long time ago, before I was married, I was working as a part-time basketball coach down at Indiana, or Taylor University in Indiana, central Indiana, and I had an assignment to drive up to South Bend to see a game and scout a kid, a player or something. And I was driving, had to drive back from South Bend like two and a half hours south to where Taylor is, but it was middle of winter. It was a very, very cold stretch, like minus 15 degrees, and a, a just a a blizzard developed on my way home, almost whiteout conditions. And I had to get home. I'm driving carefully. I'm looking at the road. I can barely see. And all of a sudden, I hit a patch of snow. And if you ever drive in the country where there's farms and stuff, sometimes there's nothing to stop the snow from drifting. And it had drifted right across the road I was on to the tune of about a foot deep and about 10 feet uh, wide. And I hit that snow before I could stop. My car's left the pavement, went up, and just skidded off into a snowbank on the side of the road. I'm, my wheels are off the road. I can't go anywhere. This is way before anybody ever dreamed of a cell phone. So I'm by myself. It's about 1130 at night. It's minus 15 degrees. My car is stuck. And it flashed through my mind that I could freeze to death 
in my car on the side of a road in central Indiana. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I honestly don't remember if I prayed. I don't think it even occurred to me yet. And within minutes, with this idea still going through my mind, this giant pickup truck, I mean a big truck, you know, the lights on top, giant tires, gun rack in the back, rumbles up right beside me and stops in the road 15 feet in front of me. And then this guy gets out, this enormous man, giant beard, bigger than Chris's beard, giant beard, and he comes walking right to my car. And I'm like, uh-oh. And he motions for me to roll down my window. I roll it down like an inch. Yeah? And he goes, put it in neutral. Put it in neutral. And then he goes back to his truck, and he drags out this big steel chain with a big, what looked like a grappling hook on it. And he dives down in the snow, burrows through the snow under my car. I can hear it banging on the bottom of my car, hooks that chain onto something, crawls back out again. Now he's covered with snow. His beard's covered with snow and everything. And he says, hang on. And he goes to his truck, and he has some sort of power winch. He turns it on, and it drags my car in like 10 seconds, right off that snowbank, right onto the road again. Then he comes back, burrows under my car again, takes it off, comes out, and he's standing there next to my window now, covered with snow, this giant man. I mentioned the gun rack, right? And, and I figured, well, i, I got to pay him something. He, he's going to want something. So I, all I had was a $20 bill. So I rolled down the window. I said, hey, uh, thanks so much. Hoped it was enough, you know. And he went, ah, just do something nice for somebody someday. Got back in his truck and drove away. Never even got his name. But I never forgot what he did. Because he did what he didn't have to do for someone he didn't know and didn't get anything for it. And that's what we see here in Philippians. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, scholars believe this was actually an ancient hymn. One of the first worship songs sung in a Christian church was these four verses. And it's profoundly theological. Let me go through quickly line by line. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Mindset was a word that meant <clears throat> when your internal convictions m- match your outward behavior. So he said, he's saying, think and act like Jesus. Who being in very nature God, I've got to stop there too. This is an astonishing statement. We get kind of used to it being around church. But this is what makes our faith absolutely unique among all the religions of the world. Jesus didn't come to teach us about God. He came as God who did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. We live in a world where it's all about advantage. Position matters. Titles matter. Achievements matters. We all learn very early in life where to find ourselves in the pecking order of human importance. Remember choosing up sides and recess when you're in, in uh, grade school? Remember that process, the ritual? Brutal. You find out pretty quick where you are, where you stand. You don't want to be that last guy. And we're taught that we spend our lives fighting and scratching and clawing our way up that ladder. And as we're doing that, Paul's saying, watch out, Jesus is going to be climbing down you, right right by you going down that same ladder. Jesus had the right to ultimate position, ultimate privilege, but didn't use it to his own advantage. Rather, Paul says, he made himself nothing. Literally, the word means he emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, That is, he emptied himself of his authority and his position, and he took the form, the shape of a servant. And the word there is usually translated slave. Now, this is some pretty heavy stuff. And I mention it because if we don't get this, if we don't really understand this, the rest of the gospel itself will be meaningless. See, Paul wants to make it very clear that Jesus wasn't just another guy, wasn't just another prophet, wasn't just another teacher. He was and is God. And that's the uniqueness of our faith. That God in the flesh, in the form of Jesus, came here. He lived with us. And then Paul says, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, we also get so used to that phrase, death on a cross. We have a cross over there. Some of you are wearing it around your necks right now. We think of the cross as a good thing. But in that day, at that time, that phrase, 
death on a cross would have been almost unimaginably offensive because those people in that culture, Roman culture, knew what that was, an instrument of torture and death. And anyone who died on one of those was a cursed person, less than human, an absolute nobody. And yet Paul says Jesus, the one who is God himself in the flesh, <coughs> emptied himself, became obedient as a servant, and died on one of those. So why does that matter? Well, because without the cross, there is no forgiveness because no atonement has been paid for your sin or my sin. Without the cross, there is no resurrection because you need a dead body to be resurrected, right? Without the cross, there is therefore no gospel. And without the cross, there is no hope. No hope at all. We're just wasting our time. So what does it mean for us? It means that through the cross, not only did Jesus give us the gift of salvation, which we say every week here, to experience grace, it means he also gave us an example. He gave us an example. Servanthood is emptying yourself of place, position, privilege, pride, need for recognition. In other words, where we are taught all our lives to climb up the ladder, Jesus is teaching us how to climb down the ladder. My wife and I recently traveled. We were in an airport. And we both happened to notice at the same time something that I think is in every airport in America, I think. We just never notice it. We noticed one of those shoe shine stands. You know what I'm talking about? In the airport. And there was a guy sitting up on, on, on the high chair, and there was another guy shining his shoes in public. And we, almost at the same time, we said, really? We, we still do that as a culture? This is 2019. I didn't want to be either guy. I didn't want to be the guy up there having his shoes shining. Mean, how embarrassing is that? And to be in public. And I didn't want to be the guy shining his shoes either. Well, this week I'm looking at this text and I remembered the story in John chapter 17 at the Last Supper and what Jesus did. Remember what he did? He washed his disciples' feet to demonstrate servanthood. He chose to be that guy. Of the two guys, he chose to be that guy. So often I think we say to ourselves, you know, that's not my job. Somebody might need to do that, but not me. That's, that's kind of beneath me. And I wonder sometimes what keeps me, what am I holding on to that keeps me from, be, from humility? What am I holding on to that keeps me from downward mobility? What do I hold on to that keeps me from obedient service? Is it pride? Yeah, sometimes. Is it fear? Just busyness? Don't have time for that. Well, servanthood, Paul says, begins with humility and it demands that we empty ourselves. And interestingly, then servanthood produces the exaltation of Christ. That's the third thing today, the exaltation of Christ. Look at what Paul says, verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, let's be honest here for a moment. At least I'll be honest with you. I don't know how this hits you, but when I serve... I kind of want some credit. You know what I'm talking about? When I, when I empty the dishwasher or when I take the recycle bag out to the garage or when I put the salt into the water softener, I hate that job. But when I do one of those, I, I kind of want a little parade, just a little parade in my honor. <laughs> do you know what a humble brag is? Have you ever heard the phrase humble brag? This is kind of new to me. Do you know what a humble, humble brag is? It's when people post things, usually on a social media platform, that are sort of a subtle way of, of patting themselves on the back. I got a couple examples from Twitter. Check out this first one. I just did something very selfless, but more importantly, it was genuine. And I know it means a lot to the person in the long run. Hashtag so worth it. You see what I'm talking about? Here's the next one. This is my favorite. I'm truly humbled you follow my tweets. I pray they enrich your life and strengthen your ministry. God bless all 200,000 of you. <laughs> That's a pastor, actually. Um, why do these hit us as funny? Maybe even a little pathetic. Because they're not really humility, are they? Sort of a subtle form of what Paul would call vain glory. 
And yet, Jesus did teach us that humility, service, downward mobility does result in exaltation. Listen to what he taught in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus called them together, the disciples, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Power, position, authority, upward mobility. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, you want to be great? Good. You want to be significant? Awesome. Here's how. Learn how to climb down the ladder. And here's the thing. When we, as his followers, do that, live like that, we actually participate in the exaltation of Jesus himself. Did you get what Paul is saying here at the end of this passage? He's giving us a glimpse into the culmination of all things. He's sort of giving us a glimpse at the last chapter in the book, the last scene of the movie. Here it is again. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's saying that the day is coming when Jesus will return or take his rightful place as king of all things. Not just of the church, which he is right now, but king of all things, the entire universe, all that ever existed, because it's all his. And every creature that's ever breathed will bow in worship, voluntarily or involuntary, because that's who he is. And Paul suggests that we today have a chance, have the opportunity to share in that day now. My brother Joe is a pastor of a church in Ohio, Christ Community Chapel in Hudson, Ohio, and they pick themes every year as a church, and their theme this year is Make Jesus Famous. Make Jesus Famous. And uh, my wife and I were visiting my mom and dad who live with my brother and his wife uh, down in Ohio a couple of weeks ago, and we were sitting around talking one day, and I was wearing this T-shirt. Remember from last summer, the church has left the building. I was wearing this t-shirt. We're talking about some things. And somebody in the family sort of asked quizzically, read the shirt and said out loud, the church has left the building? Like, what does that mean? And at that moment, my brother's seven-year-old grandson named Connor was walking by. He overheard that. He looked at me too. He looked at the shirt, cocked his head a little bit. And he went, oh, that just means the people are not at church anymore and they're out there doing stuff. I said, Connor, you got it. And that's how we make Jesus famous. Not in here only, but out there. Churches left the building. When dozens and dozens of adults and students give a week of their lives to serve children, like what happened last, this past week here at Kessinger Campus in VBS, Jesus is exalted. When 100 or more volunteers work with Families with special needs at Buddy Break, Jesus is exalted. When a 1,000 of us or maybe 2,000 of us sign up to spend a whole day serving our community just because Jesus would do that, Jesus is exalted. When we humble ourselves, when we empty ourselves for his kingdom, we make him famous. And the world gets a little glimpse of what we will all see someday, the exalted Christ. We're ending each one of these messages this summer with a little simple challenge. We've got lots of feedback over the last few weeks from you all enjoying um, putting these into practice. And the one this week is pretty simple. Serve somewhere. Serve someone. And that might be signing up for Neighborhood Serve Day, August 24th. Might be that. Doesn't have to be. Maybe it's just noticing something where you live or where you work, or inside your own home. And your first reaction, if you're honest, is, uh, I'm not doing that. That's beneath me. Someone else really should do that. Maybe you walk out in the morning to get your paper, and the neighbor's garbage is tipped over in the night, wind, raccoon, whatever, and there's garbage all over the street. And you find yourself initially, well, somebody got it. We're not going to get here and do that. Somebody should do something about that. But serve somewhere. 
That is, empty yourself. Be humble. Climb down the ladder. And make Jesus famous. That's what we're here to do as a church. Make Jesus famous. Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord, thank you today for your word. This ancient letter with such insight into who you are and what you did that so profoundly shapes who we are to be and how we are to live. Teach us this grace of downward mobility. Teach us this grace of serving, servanthood, that we may make your name more and more famous. And it's in your name that we pray.